So I'm Mark Curphy, and uh, I guess I had the uh, the kind of evening slot. This uh, this whole presentation originally started in uh, in the states as an after dinner speaking slot, so it's not a kind of formal uh, formal speaking thing. And the way it'll work is that there's a whole bunch of topics, and I will just talk about the topics, and uh, hopefully we'll get some heckling, interruptions, whatever. I'm free with it all. Once people get through the second round of beers, I'm sure everyone will get even more lively. Anyone, anyone Japanese in here? No? Does anyone know what that means? Top line. Pecha Kucha is this, uh, is this Japanese way of, uh, of doing these, uh, these speeches. I, uh, I went to this security conference in the States, and the speaker spent the first, first 15 minutes introducing himself and reading line by line about himself. So I decided there's a whole better way to do it. So for those of you who can't tell, I'm British. I lived in America and I lived in Atlanta and the people used to go, you're not from around here, boy, are you? I used to stick up a slide like that. I soon, soon figured it out. Being British is not necessarily a good thing today, of course. <laughs> At this point, I have a one in two chance of some nasty person sending all my personal data around the, uh, around the world. This man is called Alistair Darling, and he is far from the darling of the British people right now, let me tell you. It's kind of a bizarre thing in England, so if you've ever been to England, you know that we are the most watched country on earth, right? We have more video cameras everywhere, we have more x-ray stuff at, the, at all the airports. So I can only propose that what we're trying to look for is some guy like this. <laughs> it's going to be an x-ray of Homer, right? Who was it that decided to stick 25 million people's personal data on two disks and stick it in the regular mail. It had to have only have been Homer, right? It's kind of bizarre. But it gives me a general reminder about life. So I think Bruce Schneier came up with this quote first, right? It's like, if you think technology is the solution to the problem, you don't understand the problem in the first place. Because that whole stuff has been around for ages. There was no reason why that should have been done like that. It's, it's just downright ridiculous. So in case you hadn't figured out, are we, are we able to dim the lights of the presentation? I don't know. Maybe. Total darkness. Oh, total, total darkness and beer, that may not be a good idea. <laughs> oh, just dim them, I'm sure it'll be fine. So, so, here's, so here's the intro about me. So as you can tell, I enjoy beer. I enjoy sharing beers with other people. Cheers. I had a misspent youth. I drank too much beer and thought I was going to be a musician. It was an awful time when you wake up with a hangover and realize that you're an absolute crap musician. So I had to go get a job. I went to this place in the UK. Anyone read the Da Vinci Code? A bunch of people. You were there as well? Fantastic. Good man. So Royal Holloway is a fantastic place. Uh, Sophie Nouveau, the French cryptographer, was educated there. I was there back in the 90s. Um, we used to spend a lot of time up here on the third floor, which is the girls' dorm room, but we won't go into that after a few beers. You get to drink a lot of beer at Royal Holloway, as you were well known, down the student union every night. There you go. Good man. He's already halfway through his first. You can tell he was there. He's a genuine article. I then went to work in London, city of London, for a whole bunch of time. Whoop. So uh, spent some time in, in London working for a bunch of investment banks. Oh, that's fine. That's good. Okay. Yay. Can still see beer? I can still see my beer. <laughs> there was no hope of that. I think there was someone at the back who was a gentleman who had lots of blusher on as well, so I can no longer see him, which is absolutely fantastic as well. <laughs> so I spent a bunch of time in the city of London and decided to go join a small startup called ISS, moved to, uh, moved to Atlanta. Had a good, some good success at ISS. I joined in kind of relative early days. Decided I was living in Atlanta. My wife is from Trinidad. So if anyone's uh, been to the south of the states, you probably understand that someone from Trinidad is not necessarily the best place to be. So I decided to go basically take a retirement job at uh, Charles Schwab in San Francisco. Um, for anyone who knows what Schwab is, Schwab's one of the biggest financial services companies in the states. We had a trillion dollars of assets um, in a database in a, a big mainframe.
weeks for someone to come out and decide whether they're going to fix it, and then two more weeks for the guy to actually turn up. Literally, it's four weeks to get my DSL fixed. It absolutely and utterly drives you mad. So six weeks ago, I decided to join Microsoft. I basically had, a, had pretty much about a year off. And uh, most of my friends send me pictures like this. <laughs> so, 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 I, so I put it up so you don't have to bother creating your own. <laughs> and it is absolutely true that when you join, the little chip that goes in the back of your neck doesn't hurt at all. So if anyone's considering joining, don't, don't worry about it. So that's my intro. So like I said, I'm going to pick a whole bunch of topics. And the first topic is about... is figure out how software really gets built in organizations and not how people tell you it gets built. And those two things are completely different. So I think one of the fundamental problems that we have is a breakdown in communication. So this is a true story. So in the Second World War, there was this uh, frigate trawling through, and on the horizon, they see a light. And that light is right in their shipping lane. So you know what this whole, whole kind of law of shipping is. The biggest ship doesn't have to move. The smaller ship has to move. So the guy gets on the radio. He says, I'm commander so-and-so. I uh, demand that you, you move. You're in my shipping path. The guy at the other end turns around. And he says, oh, it's very interesting. But he said, I'm the commander of this ship. I demand you move. At this point, this guy starts getting, getting a little livid, right? He's like, no, 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 you don't seem to understand. I'm the commander of this big, really important ship. I, I absolutely demand that you move. And so the pissing match starts, right? <laughs> this guy then starts, turns around, and he goes, you know what? He said, I demand you move because I'm a lighthouse. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a true story. The ship ran aground, right? The ship genuinely ran aground. And why I think it's interesting from a security perspective is if you think how humans communicate over life and death issues, and then you think how they communicate security, it's pretty frightening. <laughs> Absolutely frightening. And I think an awful lot of the issues and the things particularly I've seen in building corporate applications
that's from someone who, you know, Foundstone had a hamster wheel of pain. We created a hamster wheel of pain, and it was like, you know, you could see these sales guys, so go, oh, what do you do? All you've got to do is follow the circle, sir, and everything's going to be fine. It's great. It's an absolute and utter craziness, and just about every large company now has got a hamster wheel of pain, right? So people are going to start falling off the hamster wheels of pain before long. <clears throat> One of the other issues I kind of see is culture. And so maybe I come at this from a slightly different angle. So when I was at Schwab, I was paid by the corporate information security team, but I literally picked my office up and moved it into the development team because the security department was not necessarily well perceived. And I see this all the time, right? You go across corporate America, you talk to the security people, they tell you you're doing a fantastic job of building this great security program. You go talk to the developers, and they go, Ugh, security people, right? All they do is say no to everything. And it's a massive problem with culture around how the security teams aren't giving the appropriate advice and all the counseling to all the dev teams. I mean, I bet there's a poll here. How many people are developers versus security people? Hold your hand up if you're a developer. Developers for security people, or Paul put his hand up. You're a security person. You don't work in a dev team. Oh. Okay, well that's fantastic. <laughs> I conclude this, right?